Who are my elders? Who are your sisters? Who are you? You know? So whoever comes, y'all don't know the board. Take them. Just say. Let them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
open your bulletin, you will see an invitation from Sandy and Raj Hodges to the marriage of their daughter, Mary Hoshel, to Rustin Reeves. That's uh, Saturday night, the 11th at 6.30 here at the church. And uh, then the following day, um, we have the recital, the organ recital with uh, Alex Turner. And I think it says here, that's at 2 o'clock. Um, special guest performance with Dan Ballard and Jamie Andrews. And the sun light up on the back of the insert just sounds wonderful. I know it will be. And also, with this being Pentecost Sunday, we will have a, a small get-together after church. Uh, are there any more announcements? Let us continue with worship.
We have been called out of <coughs> darkness into his marvelous light. It is uh, only those who love their evil deeds who remain in the darkness when we're invited into the marvelous light of God's grace. So let us then confess our sins to God. We'll read our corporate prayer and then take a few moments of silent reflection. Let us pray. Almighty God, you poured out your spirit to guide your disciples and empower your church with gifts for ministry. We confess we often resist the spirit's guidance. The challenge to change makes us uncomfortable. We overlook the gifts others can offer and fail to live out Christ's love for the world. Forgive us, O oh God. Send your Holy Spirit to us again to open our minds and hearts to the challenges in ministry you set before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Suddenly from heaven there came a 
sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other language, languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pam Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Syria and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit among all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
much choir for that inspiration. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14. We'll read with, begin with verse 8 to 17. Listen with me for the word of God. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, because He abides with you and will be in you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. A moment of prayer, please. Lord, illumine the truth of your Word to us. Without that illumination of your spirit, we would not be able to understand a single thing of God. So now it's our prayer that that spirit would dwell with us and speak to us as we wait and listen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I have a friend, a fishing buddy of mine, who is <coughs> deathly afraid of snakes. Uh, we all have, a, I guess we all have a little bit of that. Some people overcome it, but most people I know have a little bit of that. But I mean, he is terrified, so much so that it's been 30 years, perhaps, since that fateful day when his fishing partners who were managing the boat put him into that little cove where he swears there were thousands of snakes. They were everywhere, hanging off every limb, swimming in the water. And he tells that story every time we meet. <laughs> Deathly afraid. Interesting, because in fact, my friend lives adjacent to Sand Mountain in northeast Alabama. Sand Mountain is known for a few things, but it's best known for those churches who practice regularly a worship that includes the handling of poisonous snakes. I was reading up a decade or so ago in a Sunday evening service. They had sort of whipped themselves into a frenzy as often happens in those services and the time came where they were pulling out the poisonous serpents. The, the minister in charge had one, a rattler about three feet long and I know, I, I feel it out there. Are you getting a little anxious? You know, nervous? Is the fearfulness? The pastor had one in his hand. Several of the congregants demonstrating their faith were holding these venomous Reptiles, when there was suddenly a power outage in the neighborhood and it went dark. I would not, I wouldn't want to have been there with the lights on. <laughs> they began to call out to one another in the darkness, just not moving, just letting everybody know where they were. <laughs> As some of the I guess they would have elders or deacons 
ran to their cars and brought flashlights in and they put the reptiles back in their places by flashlight. And that, that evening, not a single person received a bite. Wasn't always the case, of course. One headline that I read about a decade or so ago, back in the 80s, was of a, a minister who died from a snake bite, and the headline read, the Pastor Dies from Misinterpretation of Scripture. <laughs> a little bit of fearfulness. I want no part of that worship. Ever. I, you can say I have, I don't have enough faith, that's okay with me. I don't have enough faith. I'm not doing that. No, I think it's a misunderstanding of Scripture. But some people approach this Pentecostal passage with the same kind of anxiety. There's, there's something strange happening. We can't really, in fact, matter, we don't even have language to, to describe it in, in some kind of, a, we, instead it's, we're given metaphors like <laughs> tongues of fire, roaring winds. Something happened where people were able to communicate the gospel in languages that they've never learned. This is unusual. We Presbyterians, we're not cessationalists, by the way, by and large. So you know, we don't necessarily believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased to be operational with the New Testament or dispensational where, where there, you know, every... Um, dispensation has a different set of gifts, actually. We, we're kind of open to the idea that gifts of the Spirit are something that are biblical, that are real. We have to look at those. And, but our worship is generally decently and in order, and there will be no handling of reptiles, I promise you. The word that comes to mind as I look at this passage in Acts chapter 2 is turmoil. I read the definition. It says a state of extreme confusion or agitation, commotion or tumult. Well, this certainly was an exciting day for the Christian church. That first Pentecost, tongues of fire, tornado force, winds, people speaking and hearing in languages they didn't know. A whole lot of commotion going on. But I wonder if we don't get lost. I, I think if, if that is all we see here, we're going to be in danger of misinterpreting this scripture. I'm wondering if all of the excitement doesn't distract us from some pretty serious and just straightforward truths that we can learn. As I looked at fresh at this passage of scripture, I noticed something I'd never seen before. You, you may have seen this, but I always assumed that the disciples gathered in that room that day were struck with the same kind of anxiety that you felt when I started describing the snake handling. Fear. Anxiousness. And in fact, if you read the scripture, there are lots of manifestation of the divine presence that evoke exactly that. And we're told more than any other thing in all the scripture, we're told over and over again, fear not, don't be afraid. The shepherds fell to their knees when the angels appeared. It, it happens, struck with fear. That's what you would expect, and that's what I always presumed when I read this account in Acts chapter 2. I always thought, well, yeah, they were scared out of their wits with tongues of fire leaping across and, and, and tornado winds and strange utterances from their fellow worshipers. Surely they were anxious, fearful, but it doesn't say so. The townspeople... They were stirred, they were perplexed, amazed, bewildered. They didn't know what to make of this spectacle. They thought these disciples were drunk in the early part of the day. But there's no mention in this scripture that the disciples themselves, the women and men who were gathered there waiting for the Spirit to fall upon them, were anxious or intimidated in any way. In fact, just the opposite. 
If anything, they received assurance from this visitation of the Spirit so that they would walk with confidence when they came down from that upper room. I'm not saying that we ought to dismiss those signs and wonders. We don't. We acknowledge them. And sometimes they produce a little anxiety within us. But what I am saying is that if we look a little bit behind the scenes, the scenes, the turmoil, what really happens when the Spirit shows up in church? I want to give you a bonus today. You get the whole sermon, three phrases, and then you can take them back. When the Spirit comes, barriers fall. Like the walls of Jericho, barriers fall away. When the Spirit comes, barriers fall, enthusiasm rises, and the Word gets out. No chaos there, no commotion there. That's a good Presbyterian, decently, and in order, three-point sermon. You've got it. I'm just going to take, cover those three bases and then we're going to go. Barriers fall. Barriers between people fall away. Pentecost. You, I know you are biblically astute enough to recognize that in the Tower of Babel, the confusion of tongues in our Genesis passage, where people were set upon their own aggrandizement, the glorification of humans and our wisdom and by inference taking God's rightful place to be glorified and honored in all that we say and do. The power of Babel confused the languages and God, God did not intend for these lips for this tongue to be used to dishonor him or to dishonor other human beings. God intended for us to use these lips and this tongue to give glory to God. So in Pentecost, that curse of Babel is reversed. And everybody spoke and understood the same thing, which was what? It was glorifying God. It was glorifying God. God. There's a second part, I think, that also illustrates the idea that barriers fall. This was a family celebration. If you get the history on the celebration of Pentecost, it was that, that feast of harvest. The, the, the uh, spring wheat had been harvested. It's the feast of the first fruits in the Jewish tradition, 50 days after Passover. It gives you some idea where it falls in the narrative of the gospel. It was a family celebration where they would sit down at table, even it's like our Thanksgiving, where relatives come and we all sit down at the common table. And it was common practice for a family to celebrate this meal of the, of the first fruits of the harvest in gratitude by inviting Orphans and widows and strangers with whom they had some connection to come and sit at table with them. And you don't have to guess why because their ritual tells you why. Because once we were slaves of Egypt, once we were not a people, now we are the people of God. And so in gratitude for the blessings we have received, we reach out and we include others. Take note that following Pentecost, the disciples continued to live out that powerful witness by fellowship and worship and by sharing what they had. And every day, the Lord added to the church all who should be saved. This is a pres the Presbyterians can hear this word, can hear this message. This is, this is palatable to Presbyterians. We sit at table, we share the blessing of God, we invite others to be a part of that. Barriers 
fall between people and between people and God. Barriers fall. There's this curious weight between Jesus' life and earthly ministry, his life, death, resurrection, his appearance to his disciples. There's this curious weight where he tells them to go and wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit to come. I think it's so important to understand that these disciples didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. These disciples didn't do anything except wait. What Jesus told them to do. They waited and they prayed. They prayed and they waited. Because God does the supernatural stuff. It's not us. We believe every Christian has the Holy Spirit. That's our, that's our doctrine. Every spirit has, has, possesses the Holy Spirit as a gift of God's grace. It's not exclusively validated in any one gift, but it is evidenced by gifts or gifts in our lives. You know the Greek word for gifts of the Spirit, charis, which is the root of our word charisma or charismatic. But the word has changed in its meaning over the years. It's literally translated a spiritual gift or a grace gift. A gift from God. God gives gifts. For what? So that we may glorify God with these stammering lips and this untamed tongue. So that we may invite the world to glorify God with us. When the Spirit comes, barriers fall. And enthusiasm rises. The word enthusiasm literally comes from the Greek understanding of in theos, in God, enthused. I believe Kim preached on you, you. You alluded to that in your sermon, I think. Somebody did. I think that's right. Enthusiasm. That doesn't necessarily mean we're jumping up and running over the pews or that, uh, you know, the, the preacher skips and hops across the stage when, when, with a good cadence. Uh, if you're expecting that, that's not it. Not that happen. I've seen it, participated in it, worshipped with other folks for whom that's normal and natural. You know, we're all Pentecostal. All, unless you don't believe in Acts 2, we're all Pentecostal. We believe in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We're charismatic. We have the gift of God's grace. For Presbyterians, we have seat belts, and we can kind of keep us a little, you know, maybe the most exciting thing that ever happens. I was preaching one Sunday, moving, stirring, oratory. So excited that a little toddler broke loose from his mother in the back of the church and ran down the middle aisle. And mother couldn't get to him. She made it about halfway down and she stopped and she kept calling for him. And she made it three fourths of the way and kept calling for him. In those days, the pulpit was center and, and the communion table on the floor. And, and he little fellow walked right up to the communion table and stood there and looked up at me while I was preaching. Had a pacifier in his mouth, I still recall. In a little while, he made his way around. We had a had a little uh, wall that separated the chancel area from the, the pulpit area from uh, the communion table. And he made his way around the wall and came up and I felt him tugging on my suit pants. And without missing a lick, I don't know how, without losing my place, I just took my hand and stuck it back like this, and he handed me his pacifier. And I held it in my hand and continued to preach for a little while, and then I handed it back to him. And he took it and put it back in his mouth and went back down and brought back to mama. That's the most exciting not exactly like Acts 2, but that was an exciting moment for us all. 
through the Holy Spirit. All who are baptized receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all, all who believe in Christ have that gift. The early church had a rallying cry. It said, He is risen. And indeed, that was paramount. That was the first order of business. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We are coming through the Easter season. And now we come to Pentecost. And we recognize that while the rallying cry was, He is risen, relationship with Christ is what makes the difference. It is also true that without Pentecost, the disciples were timid and fearful. And it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that empowered them to tell the good news. If I can use a, an analogy from the sports world, as this event took place in Acts chapter 2, it was 4 to 1. The church was losing. The disciples were losing. It was the bottom of the ninth inning. Well, bases were loaded all right, but what they needed was a home run. They needed a home run. They needed four runs to win. And so they broke out the rally in rags or whatever you do. This is a rally. This is an enthusiasm boost for these fledgling disciples. And it's so indescribable, they just have to use pictures, not, not necessarily words, metaphorical language. I heard about a college student who did a year studying the Navajo. Went to a tribe where they did not speak English. It was the Navajo language. I don't know anything about it, but it's not English. I know that. Over the summer... As part of his doctoral work, he studied and lived with this family. And of course, you have built relationships. You get to know one another. And, and they picked up a few words and phrases of the other's language. It's what you do when you're immersed that way. Toward the end of his summer internship, it was time to leave. He packed his pickup truck with his belongings and was about to pull out when the mother of the family came across the yard and embraced him. And in a few words of English, with tears streaming in her eyes, she told him goodbye by saying, I like me best when I'm with you. I would like me best when I'm with Jesus. You can say the same thing about our relationship with Jesus. We are the best we can be when we are with Jesus. And so Jesus said in our gospel reading, you will do what I have done, even greater things than I have done. You will do these things. And you don't have to worry because I will send another comforter. A counselor, an advocate, an intercessor, a guide, a revelator, teacher, witness, truth giver. I'll send God's seal, the author of all the scripture, the paraclete, the helper. All of these terms and more describe the Holy Spirit, God, that I'll send to you. So that you need not be timid anymore or fearful anymore or anxious anymore, but know the truth. So that the truth can set you free with calm assurance. Receive power from on high. When the Spirit comes, the barriers fall. Enthusiasm rises. And then you can't help it. The word gets out. You can't contain it. You know, it's like good gossip. You can't stop it. Good gossip. Nobody. Nobody likes to spread gossip. Uh, that's why we tell, always tell somebody that promises to keep it a secret. Right? Gossip it spreads like wildfire. The gospel also spreads like wildfire. The word gets out. 
What is it? They proclaimed the word. That's how we end our, our passage in Acts chapter 2. They proclaimed the word, the gospel, which was so powerful it didn't even need a translator. I, our General Assembly met in Cali, Columbia some years ago. And I, I couldn't, I can barely say um, Buenos Dias in uh, Spanish. That's about all I do know. But I met a young man who was obviously filled with the Spirit of God, who didn't speak any English, I didn't speak any Spanish, assuming that's what his language was. I learned from him, though we could not communicate, I learned with him with a frustrating series of sign languages and utterances. I learned from him that he was from some place with much water. And that he was very happy. He loved Jesus Christ. And he was bearing witness with all his being with enthusiasm. Oh, it was frustrating for me and for him not to be able to really communicate. We just tried and tried and tried. But all of a sudden, he began to sing. He sang in his language. I didn't understand a single word, but the tunes that he knew were tunes that I was familiar with. Oh, Lord, my God, when I know some wonder, I recognize, I didn't recognize the words, but I knew the tune. How great thou art, amazing grace. Whenever we would get to a very frustrating moment trying to communicate anything, he would just start singing. And I would sing along in my language. After a while, we got some other people joining in and singing in English, because that's what they knew. It was, oh, let me just say it. It was a Pentecostal moment. Because God was glorified. And I understood, even though it wasn't in my language. And I appreciated the Christ in him that had been invigorated by that spirit. I'd later learned that he was part of the Pacific Coast region, that it took him 11 hours to get from where he lived to Cali, Colombia, and that he had to do part of the journey by boat because his village was inaccessible by any other way. And I would learn that he wanted my translator, obviously. I learned that he had one desire, one goal. He wanted to move to the next village upriver because he wanted to tell the next village upriver the good news of Jesus Christ that he had heard. And the plan was that he would go there and live there among the people, tell them the news of Jesus Christ and within six months he would have enough people to start a new church. A lay person, by the way, telling the good news of Christ. We have a lot to learn, don't we? We were treated yesterday, those of us from Arkansas Presbytery, to an inspirational uh, talk um, by um, Professor Todd Bolsinger, who is from uh, Presbyterian minister, but he's a, an educator, an author uh, from Fuller Theological Seminary. And, and he had so many important things to say, but, but, but one of the things that I picked up on, this is how I will close the message. He talked about resistance to change. He said resistance to change is not really resistance to change, it's resistance to loss. People sometimes feel lost and they have to let go of something that, that's been valuable to them and important to them. But I like this. He said that when you run into resistance, resistance is not bad things that evil people do, but human things that anxious people do. So if we learn nothing else from Pentecost, let us learn that calm assurance that these disciples learned as they came down from the upper room ready to take on a world that was rapidly changing and to glorify God by telling the 
One thing that will make a difference, the good news is Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, Elijah, Elijah, you might recall, searched for the Spirit of God. And he stood in the mouth of the cave and there came a mighty wind and God was not in the wind. He saw a mighty fire and God was not in the fire. You recall, I bet you do, finally a still, small voice. And God was in that voice. Perhaps it's not dramatic fashion that we will hear from God. Maybe it's just a little tiny voice. A child with a pacifier. But let us listen carefully for anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us pray. We are grateful, God, for your presence with us in the and the mighty, indescribable power of your spirit when we understand that you have filled, empowered, called, commissioned us to glorify you. We want nothing more and nothing less. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, our Father. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. It is right and appropriate that God's people would affirm what we believe as a response to the Word of God. So if you will, please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. If you don't know it by heart, it's found in the front of the hymnal, uh, page 35. Let us declare the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I wonder if there are prayer concerns that you want to lift up as a body. Join in prayer for these. Are there others? Let us uh, not forget, as I know you have it, uh, the families grieving uh, the loss, gun violence again in uh, elementary schools, and seems like everywhere, shopping malls. And so let's. Let's pray for those grieving parents and communities that are struggling to heal. And for our world that's so broken. Let's pray together. Lord, it's so easy for us to forget while we are safe in our sanctuary that the world is not a safe place. And that even while we can and do experience the calm assurance of your spirit with us and your, and your redemption in us. The cold, dark, sometimes dismal world has victims everywhere. Leaves, brokenness, shattered dreams. And Lord, even even in our own 
families and community, there's plenty of brokenness and difficulties and ailments, illness. There are things that would rob us of our, of our joy in Christ. And so we make an humble petition. We pray for your spirit because we need you. We pray that you would comfort the mourning, those who grieve. We pray that you would also be alongside those who rejoice, that they would, uh, in these days of rejoicing and eager anticipation of the future, be mindful that you are the source of help and strength, no matter what, that you alone, God, provide us with stability that is good for today and good for tomorrow and good for eternity. That is good news, and we pray that you would enable us to declare that good news with what we say and do as we join praying together that prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will continue with our COVID protocol. We're not going to pass an offering plate today. Nonetheless, it is an act of worship to give. And so we encourage you to give, to worship God by giving uh, the gifts that you, uh, at least some portion of what God has given you. And uh, you may drop your offering in the offering plates as you leave the sanctuary today. Or uh, if you happen to be joining us in worship online, feel free to send your uh, offering into the church office uh, we appreciate God, I am sure, is pleased that we continue to be able to do the work of ministry that God has called us uh, to do here uh, through the generosity, the cheerful giving of God's people. Let us then celebrate God's goodness as we stand together to sing the doxology. <laughs>
Uh, I have some gloves here I will put on and we'll make sure that you have uh, the elements distributed to you. So again, we'll come to the front, not in tension, but go ahead and take the cup and the bread. You can take it back to your seat and uh, at the end we'll all participate together. That makes sense. My joy to invite you to this table. This is, uh, this is not a table that belongs to one church, not to one denomination, uh, not, not to any local church, but it is a table that belongs to the Lord. And the Lord, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ is the host who invites us and welcomes us to this table. So you do not have to be a member of this church or any church to participate. You need to uh, be redeemed by the shed blood, broken body of Jesus. You need to have faith, and that's all that's required to come to this table. You are all invited. We give thanks for the grace and goodness of God. Throughout history, God has revealed a graciousness. God has called from slavery. God has called from the brokenness and the darkness that we, we all have experienced. And God has wooed people to himself. And God himself has made a way for us to be right with God. Righteousness that is revealed from faith to faith. And it's in the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God we celebrate here at this table. So we come joyfully and gratefully to give thanks to God. Together, let us remember the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is given for you. Take this and eat. In the same way, after the meal, having blessed the cup, Jesus poured the wine, saying to his disciples, this is a new covenant I make with you, shedding my blood for the cleansing of your sins. Drink all of you of it. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember me until I come. Let us pray. Lord, bless these elements. Apart from their ordinary use as bread and wine, may they be a mystical symbol, a remembrance, a spiritual experience for us as we come to this table where you are the host. And you are actually in the elements. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The table is set. All is ready. Please come.
for the people of God. Let us share together this sacred meal. We give thanks, eternal one, for every gift, but especially on this day, we thank you for the gift of your spirit. We thank you for the gift of your grace. And we thank you for the gift of your Son, in whose name we live and move and have our being. Amen. May we stand together as we close with hymn number 769, For Everyone More.
Amen. In the power and the presence of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go forth, tell the good news, bless the land, love the people.